Um, my name is Dale R. Terry. Um, I was in the United States Army <clears throat> from July the 28th, 1967 until my separation October 11th, 1973. And uh, I was in the uh, intelligence branch that entire time. All right. Um, so if you would just tell us a little bit about you know, where you grew up, where you're from, um, stuff like that, where you went to high school. I was born October the 13th, 1945, in the Wichita Hospital, which no longer exists. It uh, went out of business uh, way back in the, I think, 50s. Uh, it became an insane asylum, as I later heard. I said, well, my birth must have really done them in or something. <laughs> Uh, but I was uh, uh, raised there in Wichita and spent the first oh, five years of my life there. And then my dad, who was uh, a, a, a mechanic for the United States government, he was activated in the Air National Guard. And we moved to Louisiana for about a year. And then we came back to Wichita after that. <clears throat> and my dad stayed in the military service, uh, but as a civilian. Uh, and um, so I was basically raised my, most of my life in Wichita. Uh, I decided uh, that I wanted to go to school there locally in Wichita and not go away to college. So I enrolled at Wichita State University. It had just become Wichita State University uh, and uh, was there for four years and I got a degree in the uh, history, uh, American uh, history, that's a story in and of itself. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get a degree in European history, but uh, they uh, didn't offer uh, two cr critical courses my last year, and I had to switch majors from uh, European history to American history. But it really didn't make that much difference. History is, is pretty much history. And uh, the interesting thing is, uh, I, I, because of my brother's involvement with Reserve Officer Training Corps, uh, I decided I would do the same thing. So. I went into the uh, Army ROTC department there while I was studying at Wichita State and uh, did my four years with them. In my last two years, I applied for and received a two-year scholarship through the Army. So my last two years were basically paid for by the United States Army. And because of that, I had a six-year obligation when I went on active duty instead of the normal two years. Mm -hmm. And um, so... Um, I went ahead and got my degree, I got my commission, and uh, my first uh, 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 orders, set of orders, I, I was commissioned on the 4th of June, uh, 1967, and when I looked at my orders, it said that I had to report for active duty at Fort Benning, Georgia, which is the uh, infantry officer course. And I thought, what's this all about? I was supposed to be in intelligence. Well, I found out that when you are in intelligence, you have to spend the first 18 months in an infantry or a, or a combat arms uh, assignment. And so they decided to have me trained as an infantry officer at Fort Benning, Georgia. And so when my wife and I arrived at, uh, uh, at the base there, we were staying off base uh, at the Camille Arms Apartments, and lo and behold who was also staying there was John Wayne. Hmm. He was filming the Green Beret movie and they had their, their Vietnamese extras staying there in the apartments and uh, Sulu from, from uh, Star Wars, uh, not Star Wars, uh, Star Trek, um, he was also staying there. He was quite a bit thinner at the time but uh, all of the spoken parts that Sulu had in the movie, The Green Berets, he spoke perfect Vietnamese. Hmm. He was Japanese, but he spoke perfectly. They trained him mm -hmm. uh, for the, the language. And um, so after I got my uh, infantry officer basic course done, oh, I need to tell a story before I, I leave Fort Benning. One Sunday afternoon, we were coming back from eating lunch, my wife and I, and we noticed uh, John Wayne standing at the entrance to the, to the parking area. And he had been signing autographs and talking to uh, his fans. And we thought, well, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to talk to him. So we parked our car, and when we went up to him, he was all by himself. 
So we were able to speak to John Wayne for 15 minutes, just just us, and that was that was fabulous, just fabulous. Uh, he was the broadest human being that I've ever met in my life. Uh, he was a bear of a guy. He was not short either. He was six four or five, and so I had to look up at him. But the guy was huge, and uh, that's how he got his start by being an extra, riding hmm. horses and taking falls and things like that, and uh, being a double for other people. But uh, he was a very genuine person. And we got to talking to him, and he was very humorous, had a wonderful uh, set of stories that he could relate. And uh, I explained to him I was a second lieutenant, and we'd just gotten married, and, and he, was, he was a very, very sociable type guy. It was a lot of fun talking to him. And when we were drawing to the end of our discussion, I said, hey, John, could we have your, your uh, autograph? And he said, oh, sure. And we had been married, oh, a month and a half at that time. And we didn't have a, any paper on us, not a single piece of paper, except one. And that was our marriage license. Mm -hmm. And so he turned it over on the back and signed, good luck, John Wayne. Mm -hmm. We still have that. <laughs> <laughs> and we're still married, so his good luck worked. Uh, but it was really a, a, a pleasure to talk to him. Anyway, after we left that assignment, uh, because I was on orders to Vietnam, I knew I wasn't quite then on orders, but I knew I would soon be on orders to Vietnam. Uh, they wanted me to be fully prepared for that area, and so they assigned me to the Vietnamese language school at Bigsfield, Texas, for 32 weeks. And they had just activated, Biggs had been a deactivated part of Fort Bliss, Texas. And uh, so they had housing there. And so we had, we got quarters assigned to us. And it was a fun assignment. Uh, and uh, so I, except for the fact that uh, sitting in a classroom for eight hours a day learning Vietnamese wasn't necessarily what I would consider to be fun. Because they sure threw a lot at you. Mm -hmm. But I was able mm -hmm. to uh, pick it up pretty well. And uh, later, when I went to Vietnam, I was able to use the language, and that's that's really helpful for you know uh, you know making the language resonate in your mind. And I found that I was able to start thinking in Vietnamese. So when you get to that stage in any language where you start thinking in it, you're already more than halfway there. So anyway, uh, uh, completed the uh, Vietnamese language school, and then I was able to go home on leave for a little while. And then I had my orders to go on to Vietnam. Uh, I was going to be uh, flying from the West Coast to Saigon. And it was around the January 2nd time frame of uh, 1969 that I left uh, the West Coast. And the temperature was two degrees above zero. It was very cold. And when I landed in Saigon, it was 119 degrees, and that was less than 24 hours later. So that was very uh, much of a shock to my system, that uh, swing in temperature. And they, they realized that, and they gave us three days to kind of acclimate uh, right, right by uh, the airport, the Tonsonet Airport in Saigon. Uh, my ultimate assignment was about 20 miles from there. It was... Uh, uh, what was that? Long Ben. Long Ben base. And there were about 20,000 troops assigned to Long Ben. So it was a very good size uh, base. And less than a month later, uh, our base was hit. It was Tet of 69. And that's the uh, Chinese or yeah, I think Chinese New Year or, or maybe it was the Vietnamese New Year. Uh, to celebrate that, the uh, Viet Cong always loved to uh, attack Americans, and they would do that in celebration of their New Year. And so our, uh, our main gate was being hit by literally hundreds of Viet Cong, uh, and they were being shot up pretty bad by our guys, and they also brought in Puff the Magic Dragon. And Puff was a, uh, as I recall, it was a C-47 twin-engine plane, uh, that had been set up with a uh, uh, minigun that fired like 6,000 rounds a minute. It was uh, amazing. And you would only see 
uh, every fifth round as a tracer round, but it was like a solid stream of light coming down from that plane, uh, hitting our main gate vicinity. And hundreds of the Viet Cong were killed that night. Normally they pull away their dead and take them away for burial. Uh, there were so many killed and so few left, they weren't able to remove all of them that night. There were two Americans killed that night uh, that they, they did the attack. And they were uh, officers. They were too lazy to go to the bunkers. And they just rolled over on the floor and pulled their mattresses on top of them thinking that was going to protect them. <laughs> well, the shrapnel from one of the mortar rounds killed both of them. So that was, that was unfortunate. Um, I, that night, just before the attack, I was sound asleep. And it was like two in the morning. That's when they loved to hit because everybody was sound, deadly sound asleep. And I was at one end of the barracks and our bunkers were clear at the other end of the barracks, out around the corner and then down into the bunker area, which is a bunch of sandbags that were mm -hmm. uh, put over uh, <clears throat> uh, steel pipes, big steel pipes that had been cut in half. And um, I was in my shorts and it was hot. And that's why I was in just in my shorts. And when I heard the, the whistling sound of the mortars coming in, I knew instantly what was happening because I'd been warned this, how, what they would do. And uh, everybody else was starting to pull on their pants and all that, and I didn't wait for that. I just ran down the full length of the barracks, out the door, around the corner, and into the bunker. And uh, I was the first one in the bunker from the other end of the barracks. But, so I was a good, good runner. <laughs> um, and... Uh, Tet was, was bad. That was the only time that I was there that I really felt that my life was in danger. The rest of the time, uh, it wasn't bad. And Long Bend was a, a very militarized base, and we had lots of security there. So, but I wasn't there very long. Uh, uh, being in uh, military intelligence, uh, my branch uh, controls the assignments of all of the uh, it's called the Military Occupational Specialties. Mm -hmm. And so when they assigned me to Long Bend, I was assigned to the general staff there. And basically what they had me doing was drafting training for infantry troops. And I wasn't trained for that. I'd been given very specialized training and language training uh, in intelligence activities. And so basically I went into the office and I complained. I said, hey, this isn't right. And they said, well... You don't have any choice. I said, well, my MOS is controlled out of headquarters department of the Army, and uh, I'm going to have to turn in a formal request for reassignment. And when they heard that, they just reassigned me to a intelligence unit in Saigon, which is what should have happened to begin with. So I was happy. And I was in civilian clothes. So um, I spent the next uh, nine months... And that was kind of interesting. I was doing background investigations as an MI officer on Vietnamese school teachers who were teaching our troops Vietnamese in the United States. And in fact, one of the cases I had was one of my former teachers because I'd had the Vietnamese language <coughs> course mm -hmm. at uh, Fort Bliss. Um, so I was doing that and I then, uh, the, the major in charge of our administration section at our unit, uh, he was a captain and he got promoted to major. He could no longer stay in that position. They didn't have that as a major slot. And so uh, it was a captain slot. And I was a captain at that time. And so they just made me the admin officer. And so I had two, two uh, enlisted personnel reporting to me. And we were doing all the normal administrative things for the unit. So that really wasn't the intelligence training that I'd been trained for, but I'd been in the unit already for about six months, so it was fine, and I knew I was gonna be uh, returning home within about four months. So I was just kind of putting in my time, and uh, I had developed a taste for Vietnamese soup, and they would sell it at little street vendor places right. outside the, uh, the, the gate to our co compound, and I must have gotten into some bad stuff because I did, contracted amoebic dysentery. Mm. And I had to go to the hospital there in uh, Saigon. It was an uh, army hospital. And 
I was in a bed uh, recovering from that, and I was well on the way to recovering. Uh, probably within three or four days, I would have been uh, well enough to go back to my unit uh, when a very unusual thing happened. Um, most people uh, don't like President Nixon, former President Nixon. They called him Tricky Dick uh, because of his uh, Watergate activities. But as far as I'm concerned, he was my personal hero because he had made a, a promise to the American people that by a certain date he would get 25,000 troops reassigned out of Vietnam back to the United States. But he'd only come up with 20,000 and they needed 5,000 in a week in order to meet the deadline and for, so he could make his promise to the American people. And they didn't have any other units that they could send out. They were all mission critical. So one of his staff people said, hey, we got more than 5,000 people in the hospitals. Let's just send those folks back, back home. And so uh, one of the people came around and they said, Captain Terry, do you want to go home? I said, what kind of joke is this? Of course I want to go home. I said, what's the deal? And that's when they explained what was going on. And I said, well, I am quite interested in doing that, but I want you to give me a completed tour because I was afraid that as soon as I would go home, they would just turn around and send me back to Vietnam again for another full year. Mm -hmm. And so they said, okay, we'll give you a completed tour. I said, that's fine. And so that's what happened. I got medevaced out of uh, Saigon uh, a couple of days later, and my, my poor uh, fellow roommate at the unit got the inevitable pleasure of having to pack up all my stuff hmm. and ship it back to Wichita, Kansas. And so uh, I got on a, uh, I think it was a C-141 Starlifter, uh, and all the seats were facing to the rear. And I thought, that is really strange, but that's just the way they did it. I guess it was a, a regulation, an Air Force regulation. And they uh, medevac me to uh, Camp Zama in Japan, and by then, I was pretty much well. And so I was able to uh, uh, maneuver around and do things in the PX and, and get my hair cut and get all spiffed up so when I went home, I'd look good. And uh, then a couple of days later, I got on another plane and flew into Wichita, Kansas. And my parents uh, uh, met me at the air, and my wife met me at the airport. Now, uh, Wichita has a very... Uh, a good restaurant called the New Way Sandwich Shop. And I was a real fan of New Way Sandwiches. And so I asked that they bring me a New Way when I arrived there in Wichita. And they did. They brought me one, and I, it was lovely. So I really enjoyed that. Uh, it's, it's funny what we, we think of when we're in a, a stressful situation. But that sure was a great New Way. Um, anyway, so I was there at home for a while, and then I got a call, and they said, well, we got... We've got orders for you now. You're going to go to uh, big to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, we have uh, an assignment for you there with the 14th MI Battalion. And so I went there, and um, I, I was still, I still had like four years left on my uh, obligation to the United States Army, and I uh, uh, was assigned to the unit and. They had, uh, it was a combined unit, they had both uh, MI uh, people with my background, but they also had pilots and some planes, warrant officer pilots and planes for aerial reconnaissance. So it was an interesting uh, unit to be assigned to. And they had a, uh, a, a fatality that had occurred. One of our uh, servicemen had died by drowning in a lake uh, in the local area. Hmm. And they assigned that case, it was a, called an Article 32 investigation, to me because of my background training, my MI training, which was basically investigation. And so I was able to uh, investigate that. And from what, everything I learned, there were some suspicious things. And I put them in my report. But the, the real purpose of the Article 32 investigation was once it was complete, then the parents could get the insurance settlement for his death. And so that happened, and I was and I was glad of that. But it, it his his wallet was missing. Uh, it was it looked to me like it had been a robbery and then a murder to cover it up, but I couldn't prove it. It was it was very suspicious, and I did talk to the uh, local police, 
uh, to a lieutenant on the police department who had the case, and he was very close to retirement, and he just didn't seem to be very interested in uh, in pursuing that. So they, I think, just let it drop. While I was at uh, uh, Fort Bragg, uh, there was a uh, what they said was a terrorist attack, and uh, a a I think it was a captain uh, in the infantry uh, was supposedly asleep on a couch, and his wife was murdered, and he was he was injured, but he wasn't injured too badly. Oh, he was a uh, he was a uh, doctor, and um, with his background, he he knew how to injure himself to where it looked bad, but really wasn't that serious. And in my, my mind, all the people around us were getting paranoid about terrorists coming on base and killing people. And I said, this is crazy. I said, this guy's guilty of killing his wife and then covering it up. And sure enough, within the year, he was uh, in jail for, for murder of his wife. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just was, Real suspicious mm-hmm. what had happened. And five minutes after the murder occurred, the base was shut down and they never found anybody. So that's the other thing. They, they, if it had been a gang, they wouldn't have been able to get off base that quick. Mm-hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> so in that assignment, I was able to contact my assignments officer and I talked to him and I said, hey, I have not gone voluntary indefinite yet. Uh, I've still got over three years. Uh, how about giving me a European assignment? And also give me the class for collection of intelligence so I could really be a spy. And they said, okay, we'll do that. So they gave me the uh, 9668 class. And then I was assigned to West Berlin, Germany, which is at that time, this was in 19, basically 1970 time frame. Uh, That was at the height of the Cold War. And the, the, the wall was up. And the United States uh, Army, uh, we had our own sector in Berlin, in West Berlin, that we were responsible for. We had intelligence activities going on there where we had agents that we had recruited that were giving us low-level intelligence on East German rail activities, what kind of fuels they used in their engines, low-level stuff. But it's still uh, order of battle information that you need to have a good picture as to what you know, what the other side is capable of doing against you. And uh, I was assigned to support a unit there in that in that role. And so they told me that before I would go in country into uh, West Germany, uh, I was going to be taken off the active roles of Army, Army officers and put into a, a cover assignment. So the unit that I was assigned to was basically an intelligence unit, but it was operating under another name Mm -hmm. with another mission, which was bogus, but nobody seemed to know that. Anyway, so um, my wife and I, and by that time she was very pregnant, we were on on a train into West Berlin, Germany, and it was an army train, by the way, which was interesting, and uh, we got to see the East Germans come on board the train and, and look at all of our paperwork and they allowed us to then pass on through into West Berlin, Germany. All traffic into and out of uh, West Berlin was controlled by the East German uh, security personnel. And they in turn were backed up by Russian uh, military personnel. Um, So that was the kind of setting that I went into. And I was not familiar with uh, that kind of cold war environment. So it was an eye-opener to me. And uh, we were assigned a a nice apartment uh, on the third floor of of an apartment building. It was uh, Army quarters. And we were occupying powers. The Brits, the French, and the Americans had half the city of West Berlin. The other half was the uh, uh, Russian sector of Berlin. And they basically closed off the, the access to the other three sectors by building a wall. 
<clears throat> and that separated those German families who had relatives in West Berlin from East Berlin. It was really terrible for them. And they couldn't cross over. Mm -hmm. They were prohibited. And they, they basically demolished all of the buildings between the two parts and made it a no man's land. And anyone that was caught in that area was subject to being shot. And we, we would be laying in our apartment at night and we could hear machine guns going off. Now folks, that gives you a true appreciation of freedom when you hear that. And uh, that was my first real experience of that. Um, West Berlin uh, was a fun assignment. There were beautiful sec sections of West Berlin. And uh, I was, because of my assignment there, I, I, I was trained on how to collect information against the other side and how to recruit people to become spies for the United States Army. And I was getting to a point where I needed to have German as a language. And I didn't have the opportunity to get German language before I went to Germany. And they had a language school in Bavaria uh, in the uh, Oberammergau area, which is where the Passion Play is every 10 years. And they had a, a, an army school there for, for uh, German. It was a three-month three class in uh, German. And I got a, an available assignment there. And so in January of uh, 1971, uh, I got a little guest house uh, arranged. Uh, I was on the second floor, and I uh, sent for my wife and, and my newly born son, uh, Jason. Uh, he was born in uh, uh, December of 70, and this was January of 71. So he was just, just really, he was like a month or two old. And uh, so that was fun. It was cold. It was really cold, and it snowed about a foot every day there. But uh, the German language school was interesting because our instructor was a uh, former tank sergeant hmm. that uh, fought during the Second World War, and then he was captured by the uh, British Army and was incarcerated in uh, England for like four, four years. He was caught early in the war. And uh, so that's where he learned his English. And uh, he was a very, very good instructor. And he had some interesting stories to tell about being in the German army during the Second World War. So that was, that was interesting. Uh, anyway, I got my German language training done and then I went back to my a unit there in West Berlin and uh, I uh, was getting to a point to where I was going to be turned loose and to go out into the city and start doing some recruiting uh, when our intelligence contingency fund uh, captain uh, got reassigned and they needed a new uh, intelligence contingency fund officer. What the intelligence contingency fund officer did was he was basically the paymaster for all of the uh, agents that had been recruited and there were more than one intelligence units in West Berlin. So I would became the paymaster for like three different units uh, for all of the agents and I was able to read their intelligence plans or collection plans and I saw the agents names, I saw the bank accounts that their monies would go into so I was, uh, uh, I was given access to pretty sensitive information. And if that ever was captured by the uh, Russia, East Germans or the Russians, that would have undoubtedly resulted in some people being killed. Uh, so they couldn't be spies for the U.S. anymore. So the, the, there were travel bans anyway, in effect. And the only way you could, as a, as a U.S. serviceman, the only way I could leave West Berlin and go on vacation would be to fly out of West Berlin on a U.S. flag carrier plane or on the U.S. Army train. They would allow us to go out that way. Uh, the very last year of my assignment, they relaxed that a little bit and said, well, you could go on the Autobahn, but you have to go with another person in another car. They have to, you have to convoy out. 
and uh, so so I, that was <coughs> that was because partly because of the uh, in, information that I had access to, and so we were we didn't travel a whole lot when we were uh, in West Berlin for that reason, and when we did go out, you know, what I would normally do is I would pay to have somebody else ferry my car to Frankfurt, and then I'd ride the my wife and I'd ride the train to Frankfurt and then pick up our car and we're going on our vacation. So and that, that worked out pretty well. Um, so that was pretty much what I did when I was in the service. Um, it was interesting. Uh, I, was, I had a, a cover a, a identity. Uh, and so later when I worked for the Boeing Company in Wichita, and I had a top secret clearance. They do a, every five years. They do a, a reinvestigation to make sure you haven't done anything bad or, or been corrupted or become an agent for some other power. And so they would ask a bunch of questions, and then they would check out what you told them. And one of the questions they asked was, "Well, have you ever had another name?" And my answer was, "Yes, I have." And they said, "Really?" They said, what was that? And I told them that I had a cover name when I was uh, an agent in, in West Berlin. And they had never had that answer hmm. uh, before. And they thought that was quite interesting. So I gave them my background story and they checked it out. And I later found out that they had run that name against my home address to see if there was any bank accounts or any, anything going on there. And I'd never used my cover name back in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I did use it one time in West Berlin, and that was when I was uh, in my, my vehicle, and I was in my cover assignment, and I had a little accident. And so I had to give that name. I had my credentials, but it was in the, the other name. Mm -hmm. So I had to give that to the uh, West, West Berlin police. And there was a ticket involved. It was a minor, nobody got hurt, but uh, I got a ticket, and but the U.S. Army paid for the ticket, so I, that was okay. <laughs> and uh, so when my tour of duty was getting close to an end, uh, I had two really close friends who were also captains. And uh, the, the Vietnam War was winding down. This was now 1973. And uh, Tom and Russ... Uh, were being separated from the service and they both had less than five years of active U.S. Army service. And so they weren't gonna get separation pay. If you are in the service more than five years, you do get paid if you're then separated, involuntarily separated. And they were really moaning that fact. And when I heard them say that, I was now the admin officer uh, for my unit also, the original unit that I was assigned to. And I let them know, because I was always dealing with the finance folks on, uh, on our compound, that there was a little known provision that there was a rounding up that occurs. And that is if you have four, more than four and a half years or more than half a year for whatever actions being contemplated, the service rounds up. I said, what you need to do guys is turn in a claim against the Army for your separation pay. Because you both have more than four and a half years of service. And they turned in their claims and they got their separation pay. So needless to say, I was a hero. Because <laughs> that was more than $10,000 mm -hmm. each. It was, it was a sizable chunk of money for them. Yeah. And the, now Russ was not married, so it was a, a nice chunk for him. Tom was married and had a little son, so that money didn't go quite as far for him. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway. They, uh, they really enjoyed that. Uh, oh, there is one other story I need to, to mention about the European assignment. Uh, a couple of stories, maybe. Uh, I developed uh, one night uh, severe pains started hitting me in the stomach. And I didn't know. I thought maybe I was catching the flu or something. And it didn't get any better. It was just getting worse. So finally, I said, hey, I'm going to have to go to the hospital. And so... I didn't, I wasn't able to drive myself. I had one of my friends drive me, I think it was Tom, drove me to the U.S. Army Hospital and they admitted me and they started checking my stomach and they said, Captain, you've got appendicitis. 
and it's bad. It's it's really bad. And all my signs pointed to the fact it was about to rupture. And I don't know if you're familiar with that situation, but when when your appendix ruptures, it sends out all kinds of bad stuff into your stomach area, and it can kill you. Uh, in fact, my namesake, Dale Terry, my, my dad's brother, died from a ruptured appendix when he was 12 years old mm. in Arkansas. So I knew it was serious. And they were able to uh, uh, arrange for me to have an operation right away. But one of the interesting aspects of that was being an active intelligence officer, uh, there's an Army regulation that requires another officer of equal rank be present in the operating room when the operation is taking place because they do, if there's going to be anesthesia involved, and there was. And the anesthetic they were using was sodium pentothal, which is a truth drug. And since my uh, uh, assignment there had, had given me access to a lot of very sensitive information, they picked an officer in my unit and they said, you're going to be there in that operating room and watch Captain Terry get cut open. And so they picked Gary, who was the guy that was our sponsor when, I first, when we first got in country. Gary was a fine officer, but he was uh, kind of small of stature and he wasn't a real uh, fan of seeing blood. Mm. And so they had a little podium, a little footstool thing that they had him stand on, and he's sitting there looking down at me when they start injecting the sodium pentothal into me, and they start having me count back from 100. And I don't remember saying anything more than 97, and then it started buzzing out on me. But Gary said, I made it to 95, and they said, then I was out. And after they first started doing the incisions, and he started seeing the blood flow, that was enough for Gary. And Gary left the room, and but that was no problem because I was way out. I was totally, totally anesthetized. So uh, they put me back after the operation. They put me into a, a separate room, and there were other uh, people, other uh, uh, appendicitis cases there, and a couple of them had ruptured, mm. and they had been there for weeks, uh, and they were pumping their stomach, and they were putting all kinds of antibiotics into them to fight off the infection that was in their stomach. So I was very thankful that mine had been removed before it could rupture. And I was admitted on December the 20th and I was released December the 24th to go home. So it was Christmas Eve and that was, that was really great. And so I was able to spend Christmas with my wife and my new son at the house. And so then, uh, it was toward the end of my tour and we were getting ready to be assigned back and I got orders to go to the career course for military intelligence. And I had learned quite a bit about the way the services worked and the way the regulations worked. And I suspected that with the other two officers getting their RIF notices, reduction in force notices, because of Vietnam winding down, they just didn't need a bunch of us reserve officers on active duty that my reserve, uh, my RIF orders probably were hung up somewhere in the process. And so as soon as I got home on my leave, I called my assignments officer and I said, hey, I want you to check to see if I'm on the RIF notices. And he did, he said, nope, you're not on them. I said, you need to check the special list. Cause I said, I was in a, a, an undercover assignment. Oh yeah, that's right. And he checked and he said, yep, you're on it. <laughs> so I, w I knew I was going to be getting out of the service within 90 days. And he said, where do you want to be assigned for that 90 days? And I said, well, how about Fort Riley, Kansas? Because that was the closest Army base to Wichita. And so he said, yep, we can do that. So they assigned me to the 1st Infantry Division at Fort Riley. And uh, we spent some of that time at Fort Riley, but then... Now they had a, a, a program that they were just putting into effect to retrain people that were getting out of the service to help them enter civilian life uh, with a smoother transition. Because Vietnam was a kind of a, uh, it was an intense experience for a lot of folks. And they were having PTSD issues, that's post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, 
I didn't have that because I wasn't in a combat assignment in Vietnam, but a lot of the guys were having that problem. And so they had this uh, transition program that they had come up with to help ease people's transition back into civilian life. And with my background, they said, you know, you would be a, a really good person to go to work for a credit uh, uh, union that does uh, in, uh, investigations uh, for, for and, and, and also collection of uh, bad debts because you know how to find people and you know how to interview and collect that information. So they assigned me to a credit union that was willing to, because it was free. They didn't have to pay a cent for me. I was still drawing my uh, service pay. So I worked for them for about three months and I was able to track down and, and uh, help them uh, collect some bad debts, and they, they liked what they saw. And they said, hey, we would like to make you a job offer. And I said, no, I'm going back to Wichita. So I appreciate your offer, but I, I'm going home. And so when I separated from the service on October the 11th, uh, Pat and I got into the car with our son, Jason, and we headed toward Wichita. That was uh, uh, right after a huge a uh, thunderstorm had hit the area and, and caused major flooding on both sides of the highways, the interstates. And uh, we, were, we were nervous about, are we going to be able to make it to Wichita? But we, were, we stayed on the main highways, and they didn't have them blocked off. So I-70 and I-35 uh, had a lot of problems, but we made it back to Wichita. And... Um, that was the first time that I'd ever uh, been eligible to receive uh, unemployment mm -hmm. insurance compensation. <clears throat> and so I went ahead and signed up for it there in Wichita, and I drew one week of pay, and then I got a job with the city of Wichita. And they had uh, uh, some positions for monitoring uh, Department of uh, Defense training classes uh, for people transitioning like me. And there were a bunch of folks that were uh, in classes and I, I went and inspected those programs against the criteria. And so that my training stood me in pretty good stead for doing that type of work. But I really wasn't happy in doing that. Um, I had a car, but I drove, I, I rode the bus every day to work because it stopped a block from where I was living and it was just easier. And that way my wife could have the car. And, uh, and so I did that, and then I noticed in the newspaper an article for a security manager for the Boeing company. And I applied for that job, and they really liked what they saw in my background. And they made the job offer, and I accepted it. So I went to work for the Boeing company as a security investigator, and that was in uh, 1974, May 13th, 1974. And I worked for the Boeing Company for the next 36 years. And I had some very interesting cases working for the Boeing Company. Um, we had one case where one of our contracts people uh, wanted to defraud the government and Boeing of about $6 million. And what he came up with was a scheme that was pretty ingenious and it could have worked if, if he'd had anybody join with him in a conspiracy. But no one that he posed the question to was willing to betray the United States. Uh, and they were Boeing employees, too. And mm -hmm. they didn't want to do the bad things for the company. And so they came to me mm -hmm. to investigate it. And I found out that uh, what was going on. And we contacted the FBI. And they were quite interested in that. What, what the scheme was was to... Uh, at that point, we were going through a re-engine program on KC-135 aircraft where they would replace the engines with uh, commercial engines that had been zero-timed. In other words, basically totally refurbished and made like new. And we would, go, we would send teams out to all the airlines and look at their planes and record which planes were the most uh, uh, useful and easiest to, to do for the refurbishment. And we kept that information, and we, we, our quality control group was the one that headed up that activity. And so this is who the contracts man contacted. And he contacted uh, Gary Cooper, 
to do to, to help him to conspire with him and Gary immediately contacted me and let me know what was going on and then uh, the uh, contracts guy also contacted a local aerospace firm to see if they would be willing to finance uh, what he wanted to do was come up with uh, uh, contractual means of holding any engines and not sell them to Boeing but uh, uh, go through him in order to mark up the cost of those engines. And that was basically defrauding the United States government and the Boeing Company, if that were to be successfully concluded. And when he approached the uh, Ryan Aviation, uh, Ryan, the owner, uh, also contacted one of our vice presidents and said, this is bad stuff. You need to be aware of this. And so he contacted me as well. So the two people that our contracts guy tried to conspire with turned him in, mm. which made me feel good that we have good people out there. Mm. And so when we contacted the FBI, they were very interested in the case. We, we uh, asked Ryan if he would be willing to have his office wired. And so we set up a wire there. And when Eppert, that was the contracts guy name, showed up that night uh, to make his pitch to uh, Mr. Ryan, we taped it. And right after he came out of Ryan's office, I was there and he recognized me and his face just turned white because he knew he'd been caught. And we informed him that he was no longer an employee of the Boeing Company, that he was terminated. We had our uh, HR rep there as well to make it all legal. And uh, we said, uh, you can't come back on our property. Uh, if you identify what you have as personal property, we will box it up and bring it to you. And that's what happened. And so I never saw him again. His name was John Wayne Eppert. So we had John Wayne Eppert conspiring with Gary Cooper, or trying to, to defraud the Boeing Company. So that was my cowboy case. <laughs> and uh, I had uh, several more interesting cases. I, I didn't mention this, but I had a case that was quite interesting when I was in Vietnam. Uh, Jim Lamson was my roommate who also boxed up all my stuff when I got sick and was sent back. Jim and I were out and we were tooling around in a Jeep one Sunday afternoon, when, early afternoon, when we got a call from our headquarters on the radio that we had to come back right away. And so we drove back. And when we got there, they said, you know, we've got a situation going on here. There's a U.S. Army major who has an intelligence collection plan that he had in a little blue ditty bag. And when he stopped to make a phone call uh, at the uh, uh, airport, he set the bag down and a Vietnamese second lieutenant had exactly the same kind of ditty bag and he set his down. And when they left, they'd gotten each other's bags by mistake and didn't realize it. And here we have a secret collection plan with names and financial information for Vietnamese people. And those folks' lives are at stake here. We've got to recover that plan, uh, ideally before it's ever opened. And so they said, here is the, and based on the information that was in the Vietnamese bag that the major had, we knew it was a Vietnamese second lieutenant who, whose parents lived in uh, Saigon. And he was supposedly coming to see his parents for the weekend. And, uh, and his uncle. And so we went to the uncle's place first, and the uncle uh, said, well, he's, he's in town, but he's over with his folks. And uh, so uh, I had a, 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 an interpreter there. Even though I spoke Vietnamese, I didn't feel comfortable because I, I didn't know Saigon really well. And there were areas you just didn't want to be in after hours, a, a, after dark. Uh, because the Viet Cong were, were in Saigon. And so we decided we were going to find it that afternoon or we were going to wait until the next day to continue to look. And we looked and looked for the address. And Vietnam, especially Saigon, it was a hopscotch of how they numbered residences. And we were having a heck of a time trying to find the parents' home. Mm. And our interpreter was getting frustrated 
And there were all kinds of little kids running around trying to figure out what we were doing. And I said to the interpreter, why don't you just say to the, the kids, it's too bad the parents aren't going to get the money because we can't find them. And within three minutes, we were being escorted to the front door of the parents' home. And when we knocked on the door, the second lieutenant came to the door and said, oh, I'm so happy to see you here. And he handed the blue bag to me. I didn't have his bag, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I accepted it and I looked inside and everything had been opened. Now, we got a statement from him that he signed and his parents signed that he had not photographed the contents. He had looked at them, but he had not photographed them. And we turned all that in. So we don't know what happened, but they probably uh, ended up writing off that, that plan mm -hmm. as, as just not being a wise thing to do. I never heard if anybody had been compromised, uh, but it was interesting that to find that house, what you do is you find, you find a hook. <laughs> and the hook was money. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's too bad the parents aren't going to get the money for this. Well, the kids were trying to help out those parents. So. Uh, so I worked for the Boeing Company for 36 years. And my job with the Boeing Company pre pre predominantly was uh, to be the manager of investigations for those years, but also uh, we ran into a period of time when the uh, our workload was really coming down and they were starting to lay off a bunch of Boeing employees, including people in security. And uh, so they were uh, looking for, uh, we, had, we had a uniform side of security and then the intelligence side or, or the classified program side of which I was in charge. And so they came to me and they said, hey, um, why don't you let somebody else run the classified side and you become one of our uniformed captains because they lost some captains due to uh, retirements. And so I became a captain on the uniformed side of security, which meant that I started carrying a 40 caliber pistol and got trained in the uniform side, and to include our dispatching. We had uh, over 20,000 employees at that time. It was coming down, but we still had 20,000 at that time. So it was a small town, really. And we worked three shifts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we had our own dispatch function, which basically uh, had two dispatchers most of the time. And so we were able to, and, and we were a combined department, which is fire and security. So we, any fire on on property, we responded the the uh, ambulances and the fire fire engines to the fire, and the security people would be there to if they needed to escort any uh, uh, local ambulance personnel or local uh, police personnel on our property. So I did that for about uh, eight years. And that was interesting. That was that was rewarding, because I was able to do things. I, I felt like there were some people that might have even had their lives saved because of some of the actions that I took, and uh, and it was a new, whole new experience for me doing the uniform side of the house. And uh, now that I'm uh, living in uh, Kansas City, and I see the Johnson County Community College, I see the college has. See, that's another aspect, and that's campus security. So there's a lot of different kinds of security. Uh, and there's a criminal justice uh, component here at Johnson County Community College. So, and I did teach uh, administration of justice classes for uh, the uh, Wichita State University while I was uh, going at nights for my master's degree in AJ, which I did get. So I've had a, a, a fun, fun life, actually. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting life. And my uh, two sons now live in the Kansas City area and are both uh, professionals in the uh, IT uh, world. Mm -hmm. And I have a grandson, and he is a joy. Hmm. 
he loves trains, and so I get to go with him, and we do rail fanning activities, looking at trains. And mm -hmm. When the big boy was here in Kansas City recently, we were able to go see the big boy and get our picture taken with the big boy. So it's been, uh, it's been a rewarding life. Uh, I didn't mention another component of what I did for the Boeing Company, and that was all of their classified programs in Wichita were my responsibility. And that included the Air Force One program. Boeing Wichita provided the uh, executive aircraft for the president to fly on, as well as a um, uh, number of aircraft for uh, other staff people uh, for the United States government. And, uh, but the two Air Force One planes took up a lot of our time because we were responsible for doing depot level, depot level maintenance on those planes we would get one at a time, that way the other one could be in active service and be ferrying the president around wherever he needed to go. But I was uh, on, the, on the actual team that, that bid on all of that work, uh, and we were successful and we won the, the effort, so that was fun uh, doing that. And it was fun meeting the president on a couple of occasions when whoever was president at that time would come in to look at how we did the security on his plane uh, it was it was fun uh, meeting and talking to the the presidents at those those times. Uh, the one I remember most was Bush. He was a very very pleasant guy, very pleasant guy. And uh, but it was a uh, rewarding rewarding job. We also worked on the B fifty two bombers, and uh, that was interesting. We had a B fifty two bomber that crashed in. Uh, North Vietnam, and all of the crew members were killed. And whether you knew it or not, there's a special unit in Hawaii responsible for identifying uh, remains because of Vietnam. There were a lot of uh, missing in action situations. And so whenever they found a body that they could not attribute to being a Vietnamese, they would contact this unit in uh, Hawaii and asked them to help in trying to identify to, to close the case for whoever the family member might be if it, if it was a, a, an American. And uh, w when I was uh, in my office one day, I had one of our engineers come in and he said, hey, I need to talk to you for a minute. And I said, okay. He says, I've been contacted by the Department of Defense and they want me to fly to uh, Vietnam to look at a crashed B-52 aircraft. This was a, he was an expert on B-52s. And he said, they want me because I can tell them then, you know, which plane it was. Once they have the plane number, we can then identify who the crew were and hopefully we might be able to find some remains. And so he left and the government paid for his trip. And he was able to identify the plane because of serial number issues and, and because of his knowledge as to where the serial numbers were on the planes. And they were able to uh, reconstruct identities on the crew. So there was some closure there. I think the standard crew for a B-52 was either eight or 10. So they were able to close eight or 10 cases and uh, give some peace to the families involved. And uh, the same guy came back and, and had a, a few interesting stories because of in-flight emergencies being declared by B-52 active bombers. But Wichita was a B-52 location for many years where they would land and take off from, from Wichita. So they would contact him. Uh, he knew how to do switching on components on the plane that would allow the plane to continue to stay in the air and not crash. And, uh, you know, if they were losing power on something, he could reroute. Uh, he had the knowledge to how, to how to do that. And so we were able, through our dispatch center, to actually connect him to the pilots in the air on the B-52s during the in-flight emergencies, and he could talk them through how to do the switching. And that was fascinating to see that happen. So... Had some, some interesting 
interesting things that happened mm -hmm. during my career, both with the United States Army and with Boeing Security. So they, they had this guy come over to identify the, this B-52. Yeah, yeah. Were there typically so many B-52s unaccounted for that oh, they yeah. couldn't use process of elimination? Yeah. Yeah, there were. Wow. See, they had a lot of missile batteries in uh, North North Vietnam, and they were constantly shooting down uh, planes, not just B-52s. There were KC-135s, but mostly B-52s. The B-52s were, were, were the bombers, mm -hmm. but the KC-135s were... Uh, refueling planes that were in there to refuel smaller planes and they would get shot down and they had so many they had I don't remember how many prisoners of war uh, that were taken into Hanoi the Hanoi Hilton they called it uh, who was it that died here about two years ago uh, he was one of the Hanoi Hilton mm -hmm. but, uh, he became a senator John McCain John McCain yeah, but he was just one of many uh, prisoners of war. And uh, Viet Vietnam was a uh, kind of a psyche, psyche trauma event for an awful lot of service people. So I, whenever I meet a Vietnam veteran, I, I really appreciate what they could have gone through. Mm -hmm. And we didn't get a very good reception when we came home. I didn't have any real traumas in my experience there. So it wasn't a big deal for me, but it certainly was for a lot of the guys that saw action there and had to either get shot at or almost killed or lost limbs, a uh, very traumatic uh, event. Mm -hmm. And since then, our more recent wars, there's been a, a much better reception of those folks when they're coming home. But Vietnam was not a popular war. Yeah. So. Um, when you were in uh, Vietnam, your wife was back stateside. Were you guys able yeah. to communicate, stay in touch that, at all? That's or? a good question. I'd, I'd meant to mention that. One of the th you need to remember the kind of technology that we had in that time frame. When Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, the computer that he was using on his, on his ship to control all of the things had less power than our phones do today. It, was, it just was very primitive in those days. And so one of the things that my wife and I, we strategized was how are we going to stay in touch? And we, we could write letters, mm -hmm. but letters are so... Uh, you don't hear the, the sound of the voice. And so we decided, you know, we ought to have uh, a way of, of doing tapes. And we found small tape recorders, reel-to-reel -reel small tape recorders that we could buy, and they were reasonably cost-effective. They were like $15 a piece, I think. And the reels were about, oh, two to three inches around. And we could tape about an hour's worth of our voices. And we would then mail those to each other and play them. And not only could my wife hear them, but my parents and her parents could hear my voice and how I was doing. And I could hear my wife's voice and my son's, Jason's voice, because by then Jason was two or three years old. and. I really wanted to hear his voice too. So it, it, it served multiple purposes, but it was, so we used that and it worked very well. And we still have some of those little cassettes. <laughs> that I, I don't know, we, we'd probably be able to find some equipment that we could play it on, mm -hmm. but technology moves so rapidly. Then, then you go into your cassette tapes and all mm -hmm. of that nowadays. And even now we've gone away from that into digital, so much digital stuff. We could probably get those transcribed into audio files and oh, sure. keep them forever sure. now. <laughs> Pass them down to your grandkids. <laughs> um, how would you say that your, your service uh, impacted you as um, 
a husband, a, a father, a, a business professional? Well, it was invaluable having the military intelligence background training um, because that set me up to become a professional with the city of Wichita as an investigator for them and for the Boeing company as a manager and an investigator for them. And all, uh, so basically my entire adult life benefited from the training that I received in the service. And, and it was fun too. I, I had a natural desire to do that as a history major. I was interested in how things happened and what countries did and how they did them. And one of the things, I, I guess I should have mentioned this, when I went to the basic course for counterintelligence training, and that was at, uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, at Fort Holabird, uh, the intelligence school at that time. Um, that was a, uh, a course that took about three months. And they had professional actors under contract to teach us how to ask questions and how to listen and how to ask smart questions. A, a not smart question is when you say, did you do this or did you do that? You don't ever want to ask a question that way. You just ask a specific question, wait for the answer. And then based on that answer, you may ask a follow on question. And, and so, so, to, so being trained on how to properly, I don't want to say interrogate, but I guess that is the proper word, and properly how to in, interrogate someone and get information in a fashion that builds a picture. And if you can do that and then record that information and, and convey that information to higher authorities, they can then get a broader picture as to what's going on in a particular setting. And so that kind of training to me was, was invaluable. And there are other jobs that are out there in the world uh, that really want that kind of backgrounded person as an employee. So somebody that's trained on how to listen and how to craft good questions and, and get intelligence or get information on a topic and, and then sort and organize that information so it's usable, it's, uh, it's good. And like an organization that's, that's wanting to hire somebody, it's good if you have somebody that can talk to people and who can pick up on things that are said or, or, or we were also trained on how to look for lying with mannerisms, not just the voice, but with mannerisms. And when you, when you have that kind of a background, it's useful in a number of different settings. Um, I didn't have, there's a, there's a whole raft of other intelligence jobs that I wasn't trained for, like photo interpretation, uh, encryption, uh, those, those types of things. But for collection and for, for uh, getting spies, recruiting people, and for talking to people and learning about people and learning about their backgrounds, that intelligence training was superb. And uh, a lot of people say, well, the Army's not a very good, uh, they don't use people very well. They, you, know, there's, you don't get the assignment that you'd like to have. And that's, for the most part, that's probably true. But in my case, uh, it was not true because Army intelligence was controlled by intelligence people. And so they made sure we were being, they knew what kind of money went into our background and training. They didn't want us to get misused and assigned over to write uh, training plans for infantry mm -hmm. troops. There are other people that can do that. So uh, I, I felt the Army intelligence uh, was, was a great career to have. I would have preferred to stay in it actually, but I, didn't, I wasn't given that chance because Vietnam basically was ended. Mm -hmm. 15,000 officers got laid off. What about his um, a husband and father? So uh, there's certainly a, a problem with, with remote assignments, like if you're not given accompanied 
authorization to have your, your dependents go with you. Mm -hmm. And so there were Korean assignments where that happened. Vietnam happened. Uh, Turkey was another one that was unaccompanied. Uh, but I only had the Vietnam, and that was only for 10 months, not 12 months. So I had just a limited uh, uh, problem with being uh, divorced, or not divorced, away, assigned away from my mm -hmm. family. And uh, so I was lucky in that regard. What about um, after you got out, like, is your, your role as, like, a father, do you feel like it, you know, maybe made you more structured or um, did it have I, any effect on your... Yeah, I think, I, I think it made or? me, I think it made me more, um, more open mm -hmm. to uh, learn more, don't jump to conclusions about what your kids are doing or what they're saying and that kids are going to be kids and, and others trust them but tell them tell them what you expect and you know tell them what's right show set a good example and we were able to spank our kids we didn't have to very much but i think that's a major failing in today's families where families don't feel they can spank their kids uh, but you always want to use your hand don't use a belt or anything like that. Use your hand, because if your hand starts hurting, you're hitting too much. And I got spanked once in my life, and that's when I didn't take the trash out, and I knew I was supposed to take the trash out, and I didn't do it. And that was the last time I failed to take the trash out. <laughs> and so, you know, you, kids today don't seem to, to know that there are lines that they can't cross. And I think that's a big part of our problem in our society mm -hmm. here in the United States. There are other cultures that don't have that problem. But uh, anyway, I, uh, I think that uh, the, the military intelligence training and studying history, if you can learn how countries went wrong, maybe we can keep it from happening again. And... Uh, so the more of that information that we can put out on the web and on television and whatever means of communication that we have, the information about countries and, and situations, the better off everybody is. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, you did such a good job of narrating really kind of covered everything without me having to do much of my job. You guys think of anything hey, I missed? One thing about the, the Tet Offensive. Was yeah. It, when you were there, was it 69? The, the main Tet Offensive was 68. 68. Yeah. 68. Yeah. Yeah. You said 69. So no. 68 was very, very bad. Yeah. Did they attack every year, though? Yeah, yeah. that's what you were saying. Yeah. 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 No, every Tet, every Tet, they, they, yeah. they would attack. But 68 was particularly bad. Right. And the problem with... Uh, uh, Vietnam and the Vietnamese is they were so little. You had to string your wire in such a way, your barbed wire, and they could get through it. It's, mm -hmm. It was amazing how they could, could get through stuff. You didn't use concertina? They did, but even, mm -hmm. the, even then they could go through it. They were, yeah. they were very limber and very small of stature and strong. Uh, so, and they knew how to defeat it. They, they were smart. They are smart people. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that, that is an interesting story. When I was in the, the security unit there in, in, for Boeing, um, one day the, uh, uh, one of our programs, the Air Force One programs, uh, they had removed the clearance for one of our Vietnamese employees. Now you have to understand that they were very proud of the fact that they had been selected to work on Air Force One. And to have that taken away from them, that was a devastating blow to this individual. And he came in to talk to me about it. He said, is there anything I can do to get my clearance back? Because that's what I did for the Boeing companies. I processed clearances for over 15,000 people, taking their fingerprints and sending them in to the government. And I said, well, talk to me about it. 
and tell me what, what's happened. And he said, well, you know, this all happened because of what I said to one of the investigators that was doing a five-year reinvestigation of my clearance. He asked if I'd ever moved any money. And, and I told him that I had. And I had sold some gold that I had. And he asked me why I did that. And he said, well, he said, we, we Vietnamese basically like to save up gold and things, but we also uh, invest. And I needed to change my gold into some money that I could use to invest. And because of that, there was a misunderstanding, and that's why I lost my clearance. So I talked to all of the, the managers on that program who this guy worked for. And they uniformly said he was an excellent employee, never a problem. He's very trustworthy. And so his supervisor, his, his program supervisor for the Air Force One program said he would, write, he would be happy to write a letter. And I, and I said, uh, uh, I'll endorse it. And so we did that. And we were able to get his clearance back. Oh, nice. And that guy was so happy. But when he walked into the office, well, not him, but when some of the, we had 100 employees basically that were Vietnamese that had settled in the Wichita area working on our various, various uh, commercial and military programs. And it was always interesting that whenever they had something that they didn't agree with, that they wanted to protest or complain about, they would come into the office and I would, I would see them and I would go out and say in Vietnamese, it's okay. Don't worry, let's talk about this. And it was just, just they were dumbfounded that somebody could speak their language. That was pretty rare. And so I would, I would help them. And that really opened some doors for me. Mm -hmm. So, Yes, that's the other thing I meant to ask you. Um, have you kept practicing your Vietnamese or uh, have you stayed, like, it, are you... I, when, I, when I was at the very height of my speaking ability, I was probably speaking at around a fifth grade level. Mm -hmm. I could b make myself understood. I could ask questions. But the specialty terms, I, I didn't really study, learn, or, or retain uh, scientific terms, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, Vietnamese was a very complex language. It's a tonal language. Mm -hmm. So one, one word can have five different meanings just on how you pronounce it. So it was very, very tough in that regard. And what about your German? The German uh, is probably like Vietnamese. Without use, a uh, language tends to atrophy. Mm -hmm. Once you start reusing it, you know, you, you access your memory. By the way, memory uh, is, is, a, is a combination of locations. So things get stored several places in your brain when you're learning them. And the reason they know this is when people have strokes, suddenly they may not be speaking their native language anymore. They may be speaking in a language they learned. And so the area that has the English in it has been damaged, but the German portion of the brain is undamaged. And that's why, so that's, that's how they know that things get stored differently depending on what it is that you're learning. And uh, language, there's a number of different ways of learning languages. If you're married to a person from a country, you learn just by talking to them over and over and interrogating them, talking to them, figuring out what's, what nouns are, you know, all of the various things. And the other way is through formal training where you go to a class at a university um, and then there's another way, and that's to just live in a community and talk to your neighbors and things of that nature. So um, Vietnamese and German <laughs> are not really uh, common to each other, mm -hmm. totally, totally different parts of the world. Uh, but I've used both, and uh, it, it, it was enriching. Mm -hmm. What The other thing is, as part of the training for languages, should always include, and to my knowledge it does include, the customs mm -hmm. of the country involved. And uh, to me that was, that was the most broadening part of learning Vietnamese and German. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I will tell you that when you have a young, blonde-haired boy, a baby, in Germany, you're going to be popular hmm. because the Germans love babies. And uh, it, it, it opens up a lot of conversation possibilities mm -hmm. if you have a baby carriage and a beautiful little blonde-haired boy uh, and you're going along shopping. The, 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 the most enjoyable experience I think I had in West Berlin was one day my wife and I were shopping and we had, had Jason in the baby carriage and we were going into a department store and we were wanting to buy a frog pillow for him to play with. I couldn't remember the word frog. So I was talking to the salesperson who did speak some English and I was trying to explain to them what we wanted. And she finally got the idea that I was pointing the pillows and she said, but I said, it's an animal and it's a water animal, a vasatira. And they, they couldn't figure out what I wanted. And then I made the sound of a frog. Oh, frog. <laughs> no, we don't have any of those pillows. <laughs> that was fun. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. I truly appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome. And uh, hopefully we'll look forward to having you at our, at our panel. Yeah, I would look forward to that. Awesome. And meeting the colonel. Yeah. Yeah.